The left wing. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I realize we're just a shade late. There wasn't a break between the last session, but everyone's here, I think. So we should probably get going. Welcome. Um, uh, my name is Brian Scarpelli. I'm with a, 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 a non-for-profit trade association called ACT, the App Association, and I'll, I'll maybe just say a few words about that, but really um, just want to welcome everyone to this very interesting and compelling panel we have here, Internet Accessibility Empowering Persons with Disabilities. Um, just as a little bit of what, what is this panel about and table setting for us, you know, what we're, we're acknowledging here that more than a billion people, and, and that's a growing number globally, have some form of a disability, and it it's really represents the world's largest minority. Um, Internet-enabled ICTs, absolutely, uh, I think, have, I, hope, I, I think we all agree, <laughs> probably, not to speak for the panelists, but that ICT, I think we're all here because we agree that ICTs need to play a role in enhancing accessibility and providing uh, as equivalent or, or, or an equivalent experience across use cases, both enterprise and consumer, uh, for those with disabilities. Um, <clears throat> so um, while saying that is easy, <laughs> Uh, you know, getting it done is, is, another, is another story, and I think we probably, most people will probably acknowledge that too. Um, and there, there are definitely some, exi and, and, I, I, and I, I think we're all going to talk about some existing successes we can learn from and build on, but, but also uh, what more needs to be done, both, uh, you know, really from, from in the IGF, IGF context, from an internet governance perspective and otherwise. Um, so uh, I hope here today that we'll explore innovative uses of ICTs to empower persons with disabilities um, uh, and to engage with all of you. Um, have this be a, a, a dialogue <laughs> rather than a monologue from us. Uh, don't want to do that. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and maybe we can, uh, we can develop on, on some consensus uh, points, some actions uh, that might be needed to enhance disability access to ICTs. And uh, lastly, to, to of course talk about um, you know why why IGF is 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 hosting us here on this panel to in the context of internet governance too. So uh, be, really quickly before I um, I introduce our panels, um, I mentioned my own organization. Well, you know why am I here? <laughs> Uh, my, again, my name is Brian Scarpelli. My organization, ACT, the App Association, is an international not-for-profit trade association for uh, thousands of small business software developers and high-tech companies. Um, and uh, um, we are, um, we're, we're pretty actively, we're, we're pretty actively engaged from a, the widget we're making for our members, I guess I should say, is the advocacy and being a spokesperson for the industry across a number of contexts, but primarily before governments and in key international fora like this. Um, and I think uh, I can definitely speak for, for, for my association's membership globally when I say that, that the developer community um, is committed to disability access um, and uh, does not shirk its role. Um, and we seek as a community to advance some key concepts that, that I think we'll talk about here, like accessibility by design, universal design. Um, lots of uh, member examples, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, engagement with uh, some key policymakers like European Commission, various EU member states, uh, United States government, um, and, other, and other governments, and, uh, and through key international fora, as I mentioned such as this, um, the M Enabling Summit is another uh, uh, key forum. So that's enough about my organization. <laughs> um, so I, 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 and, and I, I will not, because I, I think our time's valuable here, and I, wanna, I want us to all uh, get engaging and start the dialogue. I'll just read the name, I'll, I will share the names of our panelists, and the idea is that each of the panelists will uh, provide some opening remarks. They can introduce themselves to you rather than me reading a bio that you could find <laughs> on the IGF website anyway. Um, uh, but uh, starting from my far right, Gunella Astbrink, uh, here, um, Shadi, Shadi Abuzara, um, 
here, Nano Kachi, um, Bunmi Durwoju, and Tim Unwin. And, sorry, <laughs> whoops, uh, George Manike. <laughs> so we have, uh, and, and I'm glad we have this number of panelists and, um, and, and, uh, um, and these different perspectives. Is they'll, they'll tell you, they're, they're, um, they're from all over the world, different viewpoints, different backgrounds, uh, different roles, government, private sector, um, academia, et cetera. So, um, after that, after, after everyone kind of gives their opening remarks, I mean, I have some kind of uh, maybe get things going questions, but would love to hear from you. So please don't be, <laughs> don't be shy. Um, where should we, uh, where should we, should we start? Want to just go right to left? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Thank you very much, Brian. My name is Gonola Estbrink, and uh, I'm Vice President of uh, the Internet Society uh, Accessibility Special Interest Group, and uh, I'm also pleased to say that uh, I've just been appointed incoming uh, member of a MAG for the IGF. Uh, so uh, there will be opportunities to um, ensure in future that um, accessibility is even more considered within the IGF planning processes, hopefully. Um, so I'd like to touch on a number of different points. Uh, uh, one of them, I think, uh, is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start straight in because uh, uh, we, we are being hosted, and thank you very much for the invitation, uh, uh, f from uh, an app association and uh, we we want to make sure that uh, uh, developers uh, are incorporating accessibility uh, when apps are developed and and while it's good to hear that commitment uh, often there needs to be reminders about this and and how do we ensure that it becomes automatic that developers just say well of course we have to have accessibility and uh, why don't we uh, have training in high schools uh, for uh, including accessibility in any IT training so that uh, young people, um, if they go to university, fine, there should be some accessibility included in uh, IT courses, but if, if people just leave secondary school and go into an IT career, um, they need to understand accessibility right from the start and, and it just becomes natural that, of course, we need to use accessibility guidelines, we need to understand the disability perspective when we are um, designing uh, various apps. On the other hand, we also uh, need to consider uh, careers of uh, young people with disability. And, uh, and so if we incorporate uh, uh, tech training uh, for people with disability in high schools, then uh, they may be more supported to take up an IT career and, uh, and uh, obviously that uh, would be beneficial both for the app industry and for people with disability. Uh, we've also heard a lot about um, word inclusion. Uh, we, we talk at this IGF a lot about digital inclusion and uh, when it comes to people with disability we talk about inclusion. But when we use the word inclusion, uh, aren't we then automatically thinking that we are potentially excluding people? And, and so it should, it should not be necessary to use those words. Um, we should just naturally um, have everyone at the table and, and not segregate. Um, according to what some people can do and can't do. We are all one society. And we see the, uh, the theme of the IGF um, is talking about um, uh, one internet, one vision, one world. And so that includes one lot of people too. Uh, so in that regard, we're talking about attitudinal issues. And, and that takes generations to change. 
And uh, the more we have these type of uh, workshops and meetings where we can air these issues and spread the word uh, into our own communities, the better it would be. Uh, I think I'll finish there. There's other points I can make later on. So thank you very much. And my name is Shelley Wazara. Uh, thank you, Brian, um, for introducing me. I work for the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. Um, the topic is empowering people with disabilities uh, through ICTs. So I'm going to take a personal dive first um, and share with you that I was only able to complete school and later on computer science studies thanks to a laptop. Um, back then, much bigger, much heavier, uh, not internet connected yet. Um, but the point is that technology is what allowed me to be able to take notes, to be able to write something that I could not do. Um, that's one example of ICT empowering and allowing people to reach higher goals that they're otherwise not able to. At the same time, the same technology that so enabled me to reach uh, many aspects that I would otherwise not have been able to do. A few weeks ago, I was literally stuck in a garage uh, because the only way to pay um, with this automated uh, ticketing machine was mounted too high and I could not reach it. I could not put the ticket, I could not put the credit card, I could not pay. Um, before this technology, when there was somebody physically sitting there, I could knock on the glass and say, you know, can you let me out or can you help me? Um, so just two examples, it's, it's this paradox. Technology is neither good nor bad. Uh, technology provides opportunities. Imagine all these online forms uh, for applying to jobs that are inaccessible. Uh, imagine all these online courses that are inaccessible that uh, students with disabilities cannot benefit from, um, all these issues that can just as well um, have the exact opposite rather than including and empowering and allowing, disempowering, excluding and so on, all these negative words. It's our choice on how to design them, how to create content, how to create apps and um, products and services that are inclusive, that allow everybody to participate, as Gunella was saying. Now the question is, how do we do that? And um, I work for standards organizations, so you will probably expect from me to say standards, that's the way to go, that's the <laughs> one thing. Um, but I don't believe so. I think this is one piece of many that are needed. I think um, accessibility, even though I'm a technologist, I'm a firm believer in technology, <laughs> um, but it's foremost a societal aspect it's changing perspective, changing aspects, changing the stigma that is often associated with that. Um, that is one part, um, the cultural aspect, if you so will, the societal aspect. Um, this includes uh, policies starting off, Gunella mentioned high schools, maybe even earlier. Uh, there are many countries where children with disabilities already get segregated away. Um, get separated from the society later on when they're in a job interview. How can you expect there not to be awkwardness or difficulty in interacting, not understanding each other rather than growing up with each other and having it be normal, as you were saying, Gunella, earlier. Um, so there are definitely these societal aspects that need to complement the technical aspects and the technical solutions. And as advancement of technology grows and continues, the opportunities but also the channel, uh, cha challenges become even bigger, the multitude. I'll throw in the buzzword artificial intelligence and machine learning, just what opportunities. Um, I don't know if the colleague from Microsoft, I don't want to say more, <laughs> maybe take it away, but there are applications, for example, that will recognize a friend of mine was visiting me. Um, and he's blind and he was using an app to orient himself at a hotel at night when he's checking in. The, the, the app will read to him the layout of the hallway, um, the room numbers as he's going through the hallway uh, so that he can use the hotel uh, perfectly um, on, on their own. At the same time, we know the challenges with AI bias. Um, 
um, so this one last point I think is really important. Technology encodes human bias that we build in, that we naturally have, and actually reinforces it to a degree. There was an experiment with self-driving vehicles, thankfully this was only in a simulation, where the self-driving car did not recognize a wheelchair user moving backwards behind the car, and the car drove over the person, in a simulation, thankfully. <laughs> but that is also to show you the, 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 the problems if we have AI, for example, supporting decision making in, um, in hiring, for example, and we feed the AI all the job applications that we have, and the, jo the, the AI extrapolates and says, hmm, uh, the true story is that it extrapolated that in that particular company there were little women being hired, so the computer support system automatically suggested that women applicants are less qualified, um, but it would be even worse, I think, with people with disabilities. There would be even likely a chance. So what I'm trying to say here is, as technologies evolve, as technologies converge, so web and app and TV and physical, now with IoT, you know, the, the physical and the technological world are kind of converging into each other. Um, the opportunities are immense. Um, imagine the self-driving car that, you know, will be a benefit to many people who cannot drive for whatever reasons. Get them to where they want only if it actually is designed to work for those people. Otherwise, these people will be further um, disempowered and further segregated. And I think I'll stop there and pass it on. Thank you very much. Hi, so uh, my name is Nano Kachi. I'm the Director of Social and Consumer Policy at the CRTC, which is the federal regulator in Canada uh, for broadcasting and telecommunications. So I am with the government, so I apologize. Uh, but we're friendly because we're Canadian. Um, I, I actually struggled um, when I was invited to be on this panel to think about what I wanted to speak to because we have subject matter experts here, people in the industry, people who are doing things. And I, I wanted to really be able to contribute uh, to this conversation. And so I thought I would come at this from a different perspective and give some insights to you on how you should engage your governments. Because I think you should be really expecting more from your respective governments um, to be uh, an informed advocate uh, for um, inclusive design, for accessibility, uh, to ensure that accessibility is not just a standalone policy, but is something that's incorporated within government policy writ large, whether it's uh, employing staff, whether it's uh, procurement, whether it's um, developing policies for television programming, whatever it might be, accessibility uh, should be incorporated in all those elements. It should just not be one standalone piece of legislation, uh, but rather one that is a, an umbrella. I would also argue that um, you, you need to demand different ways of engaging with your, your government. Um, at CRTC, we're a regulator. Uh, we pride ourselves in reaching out to Canadians to find out what their needs and wants are. Um, but it was raised by a number of groups that our processes were not accessible. And we continue to struggle with that. We try to improve, but one of the key things we were able to do was to get people to actually submit accessible documents. You know, uh, a PDF is not accessible uh, for a screen reader. And so it became a real barrier for uh, Canadians who wanted to express themselves but could not react uh, to what was on the public record of a proceeding. Um, people expected better of us. Uh, they informed us of this barrier and we worked to uh, eliminate that barrier. But we wouldn't have known about it unless we'd heard from um, the various constituents. I would argue you should be demanding for different ways to engage with your government. Um, you know, ask for round tables, ask for different opportunities to have your voices heard. Uh, use organizations like this. Um, in Canada, we base all of our policies on um, 
what we hear on the public record. And as a result, uh, we've been able to push the bar forward in terms of accessibility of ICTs. But it's only through the input and understanding what Canadians need, what the users need. Because uh, from my perspective, I could think um, someone might need X, Y, or Z from their service provider, but I don't have that lived experience and I need to hear it from you but uh, I want to be able to engage with you, to hear from you in a way that is meaningful and that allows you to truly express what your needs are and why they are so that I can then regulate the uh, uh, industry to be able to um, provide services that provide access which we equate to as opportunity. Right? My job is to try to create the regulatory framework to break down barriers, to eliminate that sense of isolation, to ensure that people have a way of becoming full participants in Canadian society. I have a video, and this video is, um, uh, explains a service called VRS. Some of you may be aware of it. It's a video relay service. It's a service that allows Canadians whose first language is sign language to be able to communicate with society broadly as well as um, uh, have Canadians whose first language is not sign language to interact with them. It's a lovely sort of illustration of the positive impact that um, government can have. It's also a really good example of the lack of um, inclusive design. So, the video is lovely, and it'll play in a minute, uh, but the video does not have any audio description, and so I apologize for that. And so, you know, and again, I, I'm not gonna claim that we're in any way perfect, it's always an evolution, but it's making sure those things are always top of mind. Um, so I'll ask that they play the video. Uh, it really just expresses, um, know what government can do to help break that isolation to sort of create those opportunities for everyone and we'll see if it plays as a deaf Métis doctor Dr. Dunkley uses technology to connect with her hearing patients when she has to make a call to her hearing colleague in Laval she uses the free Canada video relay service app the VRS app connects Dr. Dunkley with a video interpreter she signs her message to the video interpreter using her computer's camera and the VRS app. The video interpreter delivers her message to Dr. Gregoire, a hearing person, by voice. Dr. Gregoire responds to the video interpreter. The video interpreter listens to his response and signs it to Dr. Dunkley. She replies and thanks her colleague. She's helping Canadians, and Canada VRS is helping her in both official languages. If you get a VRS call, don't hang up. It might be Dr. Dunkley. Learn more at don'thangup.ca. Thank you for your time. Hi, can you, can you all hear me? So um, my name is Bumi Durowuju and I am from Microsoft. Um, I'm based in the UK, um, proudly West African, West Londoner, as I like to say. Um, I am part of the business development organisation and in, within the business development organisation um, I work in the areas of AI and um, the intelligent cloud. Again, you've probably seen all of this on, on my bio, but it's, it's kind of good to sort of bring it up in terms of my, my perspective today. Um, as well as being part of that organisation, um, I also work in the emerging markets and look at strategic partnerships in the emerging markets. And for transparency, I completely follow what's happening in the accessibility space because I, I always and often do see some of the solutions that we're bringing in from the, an accessibility perspective and seeing how actually they can be some solutions that we're trying to solve for in emerging markets with respect to literacy and such like. So I just wanted to, to kind of say like how I'm in the position that as many of the areas that I deal with sort of converge into this fantastic conversation. Um, in addition to that, 
um, and I'm also an extension. I'm also part of the Microsoft um, Women's Board um, in the UK. And on that board, I also represent underrepresented ethnic groups. Um, and of course, the word inclusion pops up there all the time. And again, from when we follow, and I'm also I'm, I'm, I'm an ally for, for many of our, our different initiatives. And so when we kind of follow what we're doing in Microsoft with respect to, again, accessibility, again, you get some cues as to how we should be really feeling and approaching um, inclusion uh, for, for everyone from, from all perspectives. But let me um, sort of focus on what uh, Microsoft are really doing in the accessibility um, space with respect to um, disabilities. And again, I'm not going to be here and start like bringing out all of these kind of like sexy gadgets for you to say we have created this thing and it's going to be the solution for all. And I think that's actually a point that I'd like to focus on. Microsoft's approach, and if you've been following what we've been doing in Microsoft, we've having a huge cultural shift. A huge cultural shift with having people like my, myself coming to speak to you. Um, people really um, having it within our DNA. Inclusion, accessibility for all within our DNA. And what we, the approach and the approach to share with you is really one where everybody is responsible to tell this tale. And everybody is responsible to find something within their day to make it easier for the next person to be included into this digital arena that we're all working with. And, and that is one of the guiding principles that we have at Microsoft regarding accessibility, which is why we're all empowered to come and talk about it. And then if, again, I sort of uh, break it down to some of the buckets when we talk about the disability areas, the, the areas, and we, we had this interesting sort of conversation um, over, over lunch in terms of what disability are we talking about, who are we talking about, and what have you. And I, and I know from a Microsoft perspective, we're looking at, and let me get the, the list correct, but we, we do look at vision, hearing, mobility, mental health, and um, speech and learning as well. And so those are the kind of areas that we're trying to put a lot of thought in. And when I say a lot of thought, it's not just how we're creating our tools and how we're looking at our development, although incredibly important piece, but also how are we operating in our physical space? And then how are we hiring and ensuring that we are be able to, we have got a company where we can hire any and everybody with any of those disabilities and more that I've mentioned. And so when we now start thinking about putting those pieces in place, we start getting, getting some really fun ways and, and interesting ways in the way that we're trying to address that. Um, and from a, an accessibility perspective, again, we, we, are, we are tasked ensuring that we are communicating correctly. And we've already sort of had this, this example and really looking at some granular details like how am I creating a presentation? How am I creating my team's web application? How am I creating my team's resources? And am I ensuring that that can be accessed by somebody with visual impairment, hearing impairment? And the answer is yes, we can do that with some of the tools we already have in place in, in some of our products, Office and what have you. This is not a sales pitch. It's actually important to know that because there's a lot of these tools that are already at our hands. It's, at, it's on your desks right now. You just do not know that they're there. It's for me to be able to tell you. It's for me to be able to tell you you can switch on narrator and you should be able to hear everything that you are, are, are looking at. It's for me to be able to tell you when you are creating a document and you know you have someone with a disability on your team, use our accessibility checker to ensure you've thought through every way that you could have made that document easy and accessible. And again, all of these things are, are, are already there. Um, and so, so, so when we talk about that, and I, I mentioned hiring as well, 
Hiring is really, really important, and it's something, again, I'd, I'd like to kind of press that button into you. Um, my lovely colleague here at the moment mentioned our favourite, our favourite, one of our favourite um, products, Seeing AI, which is absolutely phenomenal. But the amount of people I hear just saying they're using CNR, Seeing AI to read a menu because actually, oh, they just set it and they just actually can't see what's going on. It just shows you that what you, what you solve for one, you solve for all. But Seeing AI, absolutely beautiful product, wonderfully explained, you can walk around, it will see what's happening visually around you and then it will interpret your surroundings. He touched upon the fact that however, once we start throwing out the concept of AI um, in, in the area, we do have all sorts of hurdles, particularly from the bias perspective, wonderfully mentioned here. And again, I could talk forever, but I do want to say and link it back to smart hiring. I talk a lot about bias in AI, and I talk, it for, I talk about it from a woman's perspective, from a black woman's perspective, from a mother's perspective, and I talk about it from a gender, a, a gender inclusive, all, all up perspective. And the two pieces, without going into one of those talks, the two pieces are incredibly important, especially in the development of AI, is are your data sets, ensuring that you have got the widest widest set of data sets on which to build your algorithms, but also that you have an inclusive AI team who are going to catch things that you and I are just not going to catch. And, and it's fine, it's fine. I'm not saying that we get rid of bias totally, it's not possible. Humanly not possible, not even the machines can do it. But what I am being able to say is that we need to start thinking about what the teams look like who are there generating and creating this. How can I do that without ensuring my team, my AI team, I need visually impaired people on my AI team. I need, I need people who have got hearing disabilities on my team. I need people who have got autism on my AI team, and I need them trained, which is why the importance, is, as I said, from a technology perspective, going right down to who I'm hiring in the team becomes incredibly important if we're gonna make sure this kind of one billion people are being included in the digital economy. So I can talk forever <laughs> and what have you. Um, I hope that there were some interesting pieces. I do have some great examples of other things we're doing and I'm sure we'll get there eventually. Does this work? Yes, it does. <laughs> I, I have a pathological hatred of sitting on a panel, and I, I think we're getting, I can feel the body weight in this room falling down, so excuse me if I wander around. And for those of you with visual impairments, um, I'm probably the oldest guy in the room, you can tell from the voice, I'm white and I'm male, and therefore I'm kind of the world's worst person. I was at a, at, at a session last night which, which really wrote us off, but I've been working in Africa for 40 years, um, and I used to be Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, and in that role, with, for those who don't know, it's like the ITU, but for the 53 countries of the Commonwealth, I championed accessibility and disability. I held the first ever disability summit for Commonwealth leaders at the Paralympic Games in London. Maybe. You mentioned lunch before, and I suggested we sat around a hearth here. And I had some, sit on the floor all together. I had some, some notes, but I just want to tell some stories. I think you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a commitment to accessibility and disability issues. But let me just share three quick stories and then, then four points, or maybe four stories and three points. On one of my early visits to Africa, I was in a school for the blind. And I noticed, and I'm not going to tell you the countries, and I noticed the floor of this school was covered in water. And one of the people said to me, it doesn't matter, they can't see. Another story from my own life. My son potentially had a major disability that prevented his mobility. Um, thank God it, it, it healed. But we were going and looking at secondary schools. And I walked into the secondary school. We were shown around by the, the nice teachers um, and I asked, uh, how do you cater for people with disabilities in your school? Do you know what they said to me? Can you believe this? My son is now 28. This was 17 years ago. We don't have any children with disabilities in our school. Wow. And then 
another story. I was talking with a minister of education in an African country about the lack of provision for education for people with disabilities in that country. And he said, Tim, it was a he, Tim, I have a limited budget. Surely I must spend that money on those who can contribute most to our country's future. And I'd always argued on moral grounds that it is right, it is right, that everybody in our societies has equal opportunities to the best education possible. But moral arguments failed. And that taught me a fundamental lesson, that we have to use their language as well and make the economic arguments. Imagine, in many countries, people with disabilities are seen as a drain on the economy. They need looking after, they need extra resources. So I learned to say, wow, you have a double win if you provide education for the poorest and the most marginalized people with disabilities. Because they are no longer a drain when they can earn their own economy and they can pay taxes. Sadly, that didn't win. But stories, 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 stories matter. We must share them. So I... I we were told we could speak for 10 minutes, but we were also told at the same time that we were going to have lots of discussion. I'm trying to get you to smile and discuss and be active. But I, I, I will put my assistive technologies on, and so this keeps me short. I, I just have four conclusions, and maybe you asked us to speak about, well, what can we do about this? The first, the first to me, is paramount. Absolutely paramount. Because digital technologies, unless they are inclusive, universally marginalize those who cannot use them. Digital technologies across the board marginalize the most marginalized people already, the poorest, the most marginalized, and those with disabilities. Unless we build inclusion into every single digital technology, people with disabilities will be further marginalized. We have to stop doing that now. Everybody. It's no good saying just there are assistive technologies. Well, we can do wonderful things. No, if we don't enable everyone with disabilities to access the wonderful technologies that we're creating, we're wasting our time in talking about inclusion and universal access. Secondly, that implies, as was said a little bit earlier, we have to change the whole design mentality around digital technologies. And not only on gender, that we, but that's not the focus of this session. If the kids in our schools are not learning to code, build technology that is universally accessible, we are going to produce a generation of designers in the industry who are going to fail our citizens with disabilities. Thirdly, everyone in this room is guilty. We may not like to think we are, but I sure as am. I continually fail to make my presentations as user-friendly for people with disabilities as possible. Sister, Microsoft is fantastic because now, when on a PowerPoint slide, I forget to put in a, a text description of the image, it comes up and says, Tim, you're an evil idiot. Yeah, I know that. But it also says, Tim, well, it doesn't actually say Tim, it's not quite that personalized. You know, why not add a little bit? Fantastic sister, fantastic Microsoft, thank you. But we all make those mistakes. We all continue to make mistakes because we're in a hurry. This digital technology makes us hurry, hurry, hurry. Please remember, when you leave this room, <clears throat> there's no point in you being here unless you've done, you go out doing something different. That difference is always pleased to remember. The person with disabilities who might, I nobody ever reads academic papers, so I actually don't have to worry, but, but who might actually need access to your information. And then finally, on an optimistic note, because despite my wife says, I am an optimist, there are amazing assistive technologies out there, but so many people who could use them don't, because we haven't, and I have a tiny little website which I try and create and share as much kit as is possible out there. But for all the diversity of disabilities, disability organizations are competing with each other for the limited money available. Let's work collectively. Um, but there are great assistive technologies and, and amazing stuff happening. Uh, does anyone here know OptiKey, for example? It's the latest one I've discovered. I'm glad nobody else did because I felt a right idiot when I, someone told So it, it's an open source solution for people, particularly with motor neuron diseases, but tracks your eye movement. It's free. 
And one of the problems traditionally, you know, people got into the assistive technology industry because they could make shitloads of money out of it, exploiting poor people. Now, you create technologies that aren't universal, so you then have to go and create assistive technologies that actually you can make money out of by exploiting people with disabilities. Huh? That's mad. So, so let us build this open, free community of assistive technologies, because we can do it. We can do it. You're all here. This is the most important session, not just because I'm speaking at it, but it's the most important session if we're going to change the internet to be truly inclusive in support of the most important people in the world, those of us who have disabilities. And I have a vested interest because I'm aging. I have my assistive technology. My memory is going. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, wow. Um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so again, my name is George Maniki. Um, I am from Mozambique. Um, so in the past four years, I work in the region in Africa, um, supporting organizations of persons with disabilities to do advocacy and to advance the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and, and, and as part of this work, I mean, obviously include also accessibility and uh, to information and communication technology. Um, I started a few months ago to um, a PhD program and I'm doing research on uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities in uh, international development. Uh, so how uh, persons with disabilities um, influencing the, the development programs um, and especially in the global south. So, all these um, big programs that uh, development agencies are implementing in Africa, in which extent persons with disabilities are, are influencing those programs and actually benefit from that. So it's also related with the conversation here today. Um, but I just want to start by also, I mean, bringing up um, a picture from the Global South. And when we talk about accessibility, in which context are we talking about uh, this issue? So I think the first thing is to acknowledge that, I mean, um, it's a context where uh, ICT infrastructure is very poor or doesn't exist. Um, um, it's an infra it's an, a, context, a context where uh, persons with disabilities uh, also, at the same time, also poor, so which means they don't have resources to acquire um, um, those expensive technology, an iPhone, or uh, the, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are among those ones that are excluded from education, uh, from employment. Um, so uh, if you look to, uh, uh, to this picture, um, uh, will not be only guidelines, will not be only um, standards that will fix the problem. Um, we have also, I mean, the fact that tariffs for data and, and so on, they are very expensive. So it's not only um, guidelines or standards that will fix the, this problem. Um, we'll have to be a combination of, you know, a series of policies. And some of the colleagues mentioned here, we have to talk about um, um, uh, opening up the market to be able to be more com competitive, which eventually will bring up the prices down. Uh, we have to talk about um, um, uh, social policies on how uh, they addressing specific disability needs. We know that in this global so, uh, uh, social policy, social programs are, are very uh, weak in general, uh, but we have also to talk uh, about it, to which extent they uh, address specific needs of persons with disabilities. Let's say uh, to get, for example, assistive devices, which will be important for them to enjoy the internet or, or any other technology as well. So uh, the conversation here becomes more uh, and more complicated. There's also um, the issue of, of, of language. Uh, so uh, in most of the African countries, uh, the language that we, uh, we use is not our mother tongue, it's not the language that we mostly grew up speaking. Um, uh, but, I mean, most of the technology are, 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 are produced here, developed and produced here in the Global North, uh, to which extent, I mean, a computer done here 
it's sensitive to, let's say, a Shangana, which is my mother tongue, or a Kiswahili, or any um, uh, local language in Africa or elsewhere. Um, so it's, it's very complicated. <laughs> I'm just trying to, to bring uh, this up. I mean, it's, it's very complicated. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge that and, 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 and really think deeply on about, uh, I mean, a series of policies that need to be bring um, into the table and, and discuss about and how can we address those multiple uh, problems. One way African governments have tried to tackle the issue of accessibility is through the uh, Universal Access Fund, and I'm sure you, you may know about this. So Universal Access Fund is uh, International and Telecommunication Union Initiative. So essentially what happens is that governments um, um, apply a tax for telecom uh, operators, um, and that tax goes to a fund, and they call it Universal Access Fund, and this fund is usually um, invested in areas where uh, it's not economically appealing for business. So it's usually rural areas or places where um, it's mostly um, uh, um, habited by poor people. Um, but the thing is, uh, well, this is great because um, we'll bring the, some of the, 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 the we, we'll expand the services to make sure that uh, more people, including persons with disabilities in the rural areas, have access to uh, telecommunication. Um, but what we, you, you see in practice is that uh, eventually uh, in a particular community will be uh, built um, a telecenter um, for that community to be able to access uh, internet and computers and et etc et etc but physically that telecenter is not accessible the computers in there are not accessible uh, so they, they they don't really go uh, to also tackle disability specific um, needs so um, again the issue is very complex and for me it demands of multiple uh, eyes and multiple perspective to address. Um, so yeah, I'll stop here for now. Well, thanks to all for those uh, opening remarks. It's great. Um, I, I, you know, like like I was saying, I we, we we would love to engage with you, the IGF community here today. <laughs> so, uh, if if anyone has a comment or a question. Excellent, we've got one already. Hi, um, my name is Mike Harris. I, I'm a software developer. Um, I'd just like to give a perspective, which if you're creating an app and you're in a startup, um, accessibility is actually very expensive. And you don't, you don't really have the, have the resource to be able to do that. Perhaps what governments could do, or, or even big tech, is uh, incentivize startups with some kind of small grant saying if you can prove that you've developed something accessible, then you're, um, you're entitled to some small amount of money and it can just be something that's inclusive. I, uh, I think it's a shame that Apple and Google are not represented here because most of the app development goes through, through them, but um, it, it isn't so easy to just uh, plug and play like it is with, um, or if you want to scan a QR code or, or anything else that's non-accessible. Um, these functions aren't so easily switched on as they could be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we hear that very often. I'd, I'd like to counter a little bit. I, I think there's several aspects. No doubt, as I said, one of the issues is that developers get educated wrongly, unfortunately. Very often they will complete whatever teaching, whatever background they have without hearing about accessibility, without having the capacities. Um, but I think it is often also seems much clearer than it actually is. Uh, this assumption of costs um, um, is not always there, actually. Um, actually, adopting a user-centered design process, which you should be doing anyway for usability to maximize uh, you know, the usefulness of, of, of your products and software, this is part of it. What we actually always say is, 
um, y you know, um, adopting these processes and accessibility is kind of like, it, it, it highlights very often the issues that you have for uh, the, the mainstream population. Um, there is sometimes also somewhat a stigma associated with that. I've seen developers who overnight will learn the latest framework and the latest new technology or something. But when it comes to accessibility, it's like, oh, well, you know, that's going to take us too much time. That's too expensive and stuff like this. But definitely, I think more support and more encouragement. I've seen examples where governments provide training as support or encourage training or sometimes even uh, put a little exert pressure that universities and you know s s other uh, technical institutions that are not only technical institution accessibility is meanwhile cross disciplinary, but that accessibility is included in teaching, um, so that there is first of all this competency that that comes along with it, but at the same time also not this um, stigma and scare. Um, I'll, I'll compare it with security, for example. Uh, I don't hear that as an argument very much with security. Everybody knows we have to do it. You know, there's no way past that. Uh, why do we then start finding reasons not to for accessibility, right? Uh, this is the kind of stuff that needs to be looked at. Yeah. Can I answer that point? Of course. Um, <laughs> the, the, the reason is purely cash-based. Um, you, if you do security and you get a security breach, you, you will probably lose, lose your product, but if you, um, if you lose accessibility, you've, you've lost a certain amount of users, um, but you were, um, you're, you're aiming for a, a user capture, and that's probably the reason why. Um, I'm not saying it's a good thing, I'm saying it's the reason. It depends on what uh, type of security issue and what type of accessibility yeah. issue. With an accessibility issue, I would argue you could actually break just as well your, your, your application because it's not usable. And you, it's, you know, we need to move away from, I think Gunella put it very nicely, it's not about the 15 to 20 percent, which is already very significant portion of the population that has a disability. But actually, Microsoft did a study back in the days, I think it was early 2000s, when they were looking at, you know, profit-making organization, very justifiably, why should we invest in this? Uh, you know, it's a good question to ask. And the study, Forrester Research, uh, that they did with, showed that not only this amount, around 15 to uh, 15 to 20 percent, need these accessibility requirements, but around two thirds benefit from that. And from then on, they actually started changing. Sorry, I'm speaking on your behalf, <laughs> but <laughs> this is just one example. But I can show you examples from other organizations as well. I'm not making an advertisement here for for Microsoft, um, but. Um, the, the, the idea is that they started changing the name from accessibility to ease of use to signal how this impacts so many more. And I think if we get that mindset, then I think the cost to benefit discussion, it's like the elevator here. And I hear this argument very often, you know, how much does the elevator cost? You know, and we only have three wheelchair users. And then I say, okay, well, then give me the key and nobody else is allowed to use it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? um, and, and so it's mainstreaming uh, um, features so that we don't think of it as assistive technology anymore, but just as features that benefit everyone and ease of use. I tried just very, very quickly. I mean, there is a strong economic argument. One of the, I, in, in the UK, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the charter for something. Governments and big companies have a huge role they can play through procurement. If governments just, and this is a real threat to you if you don't do it, if, if governments and the major corporations that have procurement policies which say if your software is not inclusive, you will not get past step one, you will not even be allowed to tender for anything, that's a hell of a threat. And, and, and then also the rise in ethical shares. I mean, I know as a startup, shares don't really matter very much yet. Um, but but, but you know, increasingly, I think that moral agenda is also coming back. But you know, every single government and every single major corporation should insist on all of their software being inclusive. Done. No, please. I know, we're not at in you, you know, we're not doing that. Like, yeah, it's, it's you really good. Yes. Yeah, but you know, you asked the dream team the questions. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> the dragon. I'm telling you. So, <laughs>
just yes, yeah, all right. Just to, just to quickly add again more of the stats and exactly ease of use. Exactly, you know, let, let's just kind of mainstream this in a respectful way as well. And and then also, you know, I I would I I would um, ask the startups to again really stop thinking in terms of future proofing what they're doing as well. And if you then start to to um, remember that by 2000 by 2025 there's going to be 75 percent millennials um, in the world already, all who have this moral compass already. They, they are literally going to be expecting this kind of thing already. And then when you start enabling or, or letting the startups know about that, it then becomes, okay, maybe that's a cost we should be absorbing. Or maybe that's, and like you said, I, I like what you're thinking about. Is there ways of funding it? If the honest truth is, I need 5K now to go get an extra dev developer to go and act and, and get that piece done. I totally get that, respect that. But if it means that you start being creative about it, not necessarily, you know, it's about the government, maybe it's how you're talking to your investors, and you're actually saying, dude, when you invest in me, I'm not only gonna get that, that addressable market, I've also got that one billion too, plus I've got the crew over in, in the emerging markets. You start looking at a different set of business modeling, which then starts looking exciting. Great. I don't. I, I see numerous hands up. The gentleman right there. Um, I apologize, sir. I don't know your name. Yes, please. I, I saw you raise your hand. Do you still have a comment? And then I, I think there and, and there. Uh, yes. Thank you for the record. This is uh, Muhammad Shabir Rawan. I'm from Pakistan, and I speak on behalf of uh, Internet Society's Accessibility Special Interest Group. Uh, very interesting points highlighted here. First, I would like to respond to cost versus benefit uh, comment that was highlighted here. Yes, it is the cost, but uh, in Pakistan, uh, my experience has been that more often than not, the, the startups, what they do is they build a product and then they come to person with disabilities and the organizations and they say, look, here is the product we have built it now, tell us how to make it accessible and tell us the shortest way. It is, it is tantamount to, to saying that now we, we have built a building and we forgot to insert a lift into it. And, and I, definitely my answer would be to tear down the building and then install a lift and then build a new building one. So, so if, if you are getting, and if you are taking that approach, and if you are not including or incorporating accessibility issues right from the start, and you, you have not thought about the, about the idea and what you, what you wanna do, so uh, the end result is going to be that you, you are gonna more, spend more time and more money and more resources. And secondly, uh, we, we, we also talked about here uh, about the, uh, so, so what we do is that we also need to include person with disabilities in the discussions then. So we first build a product and then go to person with disabilities and their, their experts and organizations and tell them that here is the product, now tell us how to make it right. Rather than going to them and I, discussing the ideas that here is this idea, how it can be improved. If we, if we uh, follow that approach, I think it would be uh, beneficial for, for more audience. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, please. So I like this comment uh, about, well, there's only this many people, why do we have a lift? Um, invisible disabilities exist. There are a lot of people with severe disabilities that pass as biotypical, and you're not going to know who they are because there's an economic disincentive of outing yourself as disabled. Even if you can do your job, some businesses will find reasons to fire you because I've talked to HR departments and they say, well, this person has a disability. Don't, doesn't that mean they're gonna be in the hospital all the time? Are they gonna get their work done? Um, and so you might have people in your communities, you might have coworkers, you might have customers that have accessibility needs. And there's an economic opportunity as well as the moral obligation to include as many people in digital technologies as possible. 
And the other thing is I went to the O'Reilly Velocity Conference, which is heavily techy. It's all DevOps people. And Emily Shea uh, is a Perl coder who does not touch her computer when she's coding. She uses um, a software called Talon, and she controls everything, including the presentation, with her voice, and shows a live demo of coding. And the thing is, um, there were a lot of non-disabled people in that audience, and the reaction to that was, oh my god, that's so cool. And the other thing is, most of us um, are temporarily abled. You know, age-related disabilities are coming for us, and particularly in the tech world, if your hands and wrists are fine now, um, you may encounter repetitive strain injuries. So if, you're, if you have people banging away at keyboards um, and you want to keep them on for most of their careers, then it would behoove most businesses to think of disabilities for their own self-interest as well. That's a great comment, thank you. Both of you, I, I apologize, I don't know who was first. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I had my two cents earlier in the other, so I won't um, take much time. I'm Peter Crosby, I'm autistic. Uh, so my main interest is in um, Cognitive accessibility, very short observation. Nearly everything we're talking about today concerns physical and sensory disabilities. Uh, I understand why that is to some extent. It's partly because understanding cognitive access, understanding cognitive disabilities is a bit like trying to hold water. It's very difficult if you're not concerned. For me, a website that's not accessible is it's just as obvious as night and day, and yet to people around me, it's just not at all clear, even people who uh, are in the field. Um, the other problem is, of course, uh, a financial one. It's very easy to see a return on a technical investment to a technical solution to a physical problem. Do not uh, use um, a justified text format there's no money in that for anyone. So I think that's uh, w something that we just have to be aware of, the extent to which uh, cognitive accessibility under underlies all of this. It's, it's synonymous with um, universal design, and it's absolutely essential. And I think this, the question before is fa was a fantastic question. It's really great that it came up about the cost of accessibility. From my point of view, from the point of view of people in the uh, autistic community, it's free. It does not cost anything to, to have your logo once on a page instead of three times, for example. The, the, it's very simple to implement cognitive accessibility, but it is not being done. And this community basically is being thrown under the bus. It, it, there's no other way of putting it. And it's through a lack of understanding, a lack of education, and also this, obviously this is not a, a zero-sum game. I mean, it's fantastic, all these initiatives that we're hearing today. But um, we're here, and there's a lot of us, and uh, our time needs to come as well. Thank you. Peter, just, just, a, just a quick um, comment, but thank you so much for that, and, and thank you for um, um, your, your other comments about um, uh, uh, non-visible disabilities as well. Uh, one thing I, I'll just say, maybe on Brian's behalf, we have got tons to cover, and actually neurodiversity, and I'm sure Tim will probably talk, talk about it as well, is one of the, the, the key um, areas that I know that we look into. We just haven't quite got there yet. I hope we can stay here for until 10 o'clock and then yeah. we'll get everything covered. So, so respectfully, there's, there's the, the whole notion, um, as particularly from autism, from a Microsoft perspective, I'm yet again proud to say, um, we, we, you know, we have a whole hiring setup um, actually created specifically to hire people with autism into the company because they're, they're what we consider the super vowels, and, and forgive me if I'm using all the wrong languages, but the super vowels in terms of what is needed in our um, a company from people with autism is absolutely identified. Now that's for me, and these are good forums for us to say it, to say we need more of it, 
we're trying to do it and let's get other people to do it. So that's why we're in the room. Um, and, and then the other piece is, thank you so much for, for, for sort of highlighting the fact that it doesn't cost anything. So I'm literally, you've seen me scrolling. I'm not being like a, a rude want to be millennial <laughs> but, but we really literally have an, an awesome site here and I literally was able to just click on neurodiversity page and just see straight away what we've been told about when we're dealing with someone on our team how are we talking about scheduling how are we making sure that there's a space for them to be to be able to be able to focus not necessarily be in these open overly sens sensory um, environments if i was a manager in microsoft i already have the tools here to ensure that i can make somebody as comfortable as possible and hopefully be able to learn more about it as well so and but exactly that point that it doesn't take much it doesn't take that's why i said i'm not here to talk about sexy tech with you at all it's about just a bit of a bit of understanding our reading materials, how are we making that clear, how are we using narrator, how are we using our immersive reading tools that are all in there to make sure things are just clearer, just a little bit clearer. And this is for someone who doesn't have a full understanding of that, but at least I can already tell you a few things I know I should be thinking about. So, so thank you. I hope we're doing it, maybe not doing it enough, and I hope everybody else could be thinking about it too. So first, I want to apologize if I was not clear enough. I don't make it explicit. But when I mentioned the example of the relevance to usability, I actually meant exactly cognitive and learning disability. This is actually where you have the most return on investment very often, actually. And I would like to actually counter your argument that don't do justified text actually has a very high return. Um, there, there are tons and tons and tons of usability and readability stuff that, that show that this kind of stuff, I mean, it's common sense, uh, you know, break up the content with headings, make it more readable, make it more usable, use consistent navigation, all these requirements um, um, that, that, that just help make the product become so much more usable by so many more people. Um, you know, we have older people, we have people who are new to technologies. It was mentioned, you know, the global south and people who have little uh, interaction with, with, with digital technologies. All this uh, cognitive and learning disabilities is actually at the heart of that and is something that has very low investment, as you were saying very correctly, and very high returns very often. Um, so I did actually mean that, maybe I didn't make it explicit, that this is really part of it and this needs to be, uh, uh, um, equally considered. Uh, w the, the web content accessibility guidelines follows a universal design principle where we try to address the different types of disabilities, including cognitive and learning disabilities. We're trying to improve on that. We've done some improvements in WCAG version 2.1, which was released last year, and we're working on a 2.2 where we're also trying to do some work here with our cognitive and learning disabilities task force. It is an ongoing process. It is a subject that is quite difficult to understand. Uh, and quite difficult to deal with, uh, but it is something that is very important and on the table. Great, great, thank you. And, and one more, one more uh, comment, please go ahead, or question. <coughs> uh, great, uh, thank you very much for the very uh, good uh, presentations that uh, was presented here. My name is Dr. Azizi, and I'm a volunteer uh, with the only uh, school uh, for the blind people in Afghanistan. Uh, in the capital Kabul. Uh, overall, the Afghan children are uh, facing uh, a lot of problems. And uh, unfortunately, when it comes to the uh, four decades of war history that uh, we are still in, uh, it means that on a daily basis, uh, we are getting uh, new members into this community, unfortunately. And uh, the WHO uh, statistics revealed that uh, uh, almost half a million uh, Afghans are uh, blind and then 1.5 uh, million of them have got uh, visual uh, impairment uh, of one type or the other type and uh, every year we are getting uh, probably another uh, 20 to 25,000 of people who are getting uh, uh, eyesight problems uh, and this all means that uh, <clears throat> blindness is uh, a huge problem in Afghanistan. I've been working for the last 13 years uh, with this school uh, where I have established uh, a computer lab and then also I'm uh, working from time to time with the different age groups uh, on the use of smartphones 
and uh, whenever I want to get some inspiration, I do visit the school and it's the kids who tell me their stories how much technology is improving their living conditions, uh, be it uh, their studies or uh, overall general information or uh, even uh, accessing the maps or uh, uh, other things. Uh, one thing which is of uh, interest to me uh, is the assistive technologies, that what sort of assistive technologies are available and how uh, affordable they are. Uh, because uh, when you're talking about uh, these uh, uh, sensor-based uh, walkers and uh, sticks, it's not really affordable. Uh, last year I was in the US and I wanted to procure uh, for some of the kids that are uh, more associated with me personally, I couldn't afford it because each stick was uh, costing me 1800 to $3,500. And it's something that uh, I want to uh, know more, that what's going on for the assistive technologies in order to m provide them with a stick or uh, with uh, uh, a laptop which is uh, more uh, uh, responsive uh, to their needs and uh, uh, since I'm working with the blind kids, uh, braille literacy is also another thing that I would like to see that if uh, uh, the technology has uh, contributed anything new uh, which will uh, bring uh, more ease uh, to the lives of these kids. Thank you very much. Could I just make, and there are so many things I could say, partly in answer to your question. And some of the bilateral donors are now actually waking up to this. I, just as a matter of interest, does any, anyone here aware of the big um, DFID funded open IDO call last year or the year before, uh, specifically around designing uh, disability innovation and technology? DFID were putting quite a lot of money into that to support. So I, that's part of the answer. I mean, I, I mean, another part of the answer is you're building this open source community um, and then being a little bit naughty. I mean, think how much money we invest in smart cars. You know, that applies to smart humans as well. I mean, people who have difficulty moving around, we could invest that money, some of it, shitloads of it is made in that. Um, to, to enable people with you know, a range of disabilities to access and move around cities. Um, but they're not doing it. So fundamentally, it comes back. You know, scientists, R&D people, are responsible both for what they do do and for what they don't do and for what they do by accident. Tech designers coming out of our schools, people have a choice. They can go and make huge amounts of money working for Tesla, or they can work in this. It's a moral question about what kind of life, what kind of agenda they want. And, and if we persuade, going back to somebody said earlier about training kids, if we get them this enthusiasm when they're young, a few more will go into that, more will do it. This is of such paramount importance. You know, if we get governments, I mean, we were lucky in some ways to have a minister in DFID who actually championed um, disability and had a, a, a big conference and uh, sadly she supports Brexit as well, but hey, we won't go there. Um, uh, I had to get that in, didn't I, comrades? I'm a true European here in Germany. Um, <laughs> we haven't left yet. We are fighting to remain. Anyway, um, but, 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 you know, those of us around to champion disabilities, you know, that moral argument, we have to get it through as well as the economic. I mean, I, I said earlier, the moral doesn't succeed by itself, but there are good economic grounds. Sorry, I was a bit long, sir. No, oh, thank you. That's great. Um, you, you have, no, I apologize. Go ahead. No, no, please. <laughs> um, I actually have a question for you, Brian. <laughs> so, um, I think it's great that uh, your app association is, um, is um, organizing this workshop and obviously, um, as you said uh, from the start, it's uh, committed to accessibility and I'm wondering um, 
how um, your association is working with app developers. Uh, I mean, we had a fantastic discussion that was provoked by you, and, and that, that was really wonderful. Um, so how is um, your association educating and helping app developers, and is there some way us as a community can help you more? Oh, yes, and I really appreciate that question. It's a great question. Um, so you mean you hadn't set her up for it? Yeah. <laughs> no, right. Um, as a baseline, an association like ours um, does seek, we, we, we seek to educate our members about, uh, one, one about what they, what they need to do. They all ask that question, you know, they, what, 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 do they, what do they need to do uh, in order to comply with law or regulation X. So capturing all that data, which can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, is important. But um, just meeting the minimum, you know, the floor, um, as far as legal compliance is, I think, you know, we've got definitely unanimous agreement amongst our membership that that's not sufficient. <laughs> um, and it's part of why we're, we're, we're doing our, you know, engaging in fora like these and, and others. But um, um, what, 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 we're what we're looking to develop right now is a set of best practices for accessibility by design. Um, not to recreate the wheel either, you know, I think we would need to build on, on standard, standardization efforts um, or or the guidelines would be useless, actually. <laughs> um, so um, coming, you know, that, that, that's kind of the main deliverable that we have underway right now. Now, it's not completed, and it's, you know, I don't want to say we're, we're late to the party. We're late to the party. And it's, it's, it, it, we have need to acknowledge it. I think my segment of the industry does need to acknowledge that. Um, so, um, you know, I, 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 would, I would think that any way that we can... Um, that we can learn more perspectives, like what was shared from a developer perspective and, and from, from others here. Um, you know, I and our associ an association like ours, we benefit more than I can really say from that. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it influences, uh, I, I think it should influence, it will influence uh, the development of deliverables like that best practices guidelines. But uh, you know, um, m our goal when we release them is to socialize them with the entire community, and I can't think of a better forum than IGF and, and ISOC, et cetera, that we could, um, we could bounce these uh, proposed ideals off of and, uh, and work from that and improve them. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, obviously, as we've discussed, that uh, uh, for persons with disabilities to be involved uh, in, in working with you at the early stage yes. with those uh, best practice guidelines so that we ensure that we're all working together. Right, and, and that, uh, you're, that can't be understated. I think, uh, 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 you know, um, as I, you know, as a, to, you know, it would be, it would make our guidelines useless to not build off of existing good work um, including standardization efforts, but also with the ground up input from the communities that we're looking to, to assist and help. Um, that would be extremely tone deaf if we did that, <laughs> to put it bluntly. So I completely, I violently agree with you. <laughs> you. Um, great. Hey, I, I, I'm glad I got to, you know, get a question here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, I, I, I had a bunch of uh, questions that I had come up with just in the event that we had no engagement at all. <laughs> and I'm really glad that I didn't have to use many of them, but um, you know, we, we started a little late, so we got a couple more minutes, and I can take, like, I, I was thinking about, this is partially a little bit of a recap too, but then maybe a question to any, any of you all um, here really is, it just, it, it, it's, a, it's a great, dis to, from my perspective, a great discussion. We've talked about a wide range of uh, challenges, and, and where, th where efforts are falling short and incentives and successes and uh, angles that I didn't think about before and I appreciate them being workforce development, for example, not something that, and, and I should have thought of that, you know, but, but that, that's just kind of like one example. Um, so, I, you know, just thinking about, hey, we're at IGF right now 
um, from an internet governance perspective, um, how can we best realize these, you know, universal design principles, ease of access principles, uh, whatever we'd like to call them? And I wonder, you know, if, if is that, I think you've already, you already mentioned, it's a, probably a combination, you know, so that there, there is that, but, but um, there are other vehicles and venues maybe that, that we maybe haven't had a chance to touch on. For example, there's a United Nations uh, um, uh, convention, I'm sorry, I blanked on the C, on the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and there's, uh, there's the great work that, uh, you know, the relevant SIG and ISOC is doing. And then there's, there's also national laws and regulations and, um, and interesting approaches like uh, universal service that, that you were talking about. So I was curious if, um, I don't know, you don't have to pick one, but <laughs> if there were, you know, um, if there were a, a, a way to make the most meaningful step forward, if you wanted to suggest one, that, that's kind of a, that, that's me taking like four questions and putting them into one, you know. But hopefully that kind of uh, puts a um, puts a uh, you know an exclamation mark on our conversation here and, and kind of gives us something to think about it action wise moving forward. My rambling question, but <laughs> a meaningful venue, uh, uh, be it a national law, a, a treaty, um, uh, you know. Standardization effort that's that's not housed by a government entity. Um, uh, what do you all think? <laughs> all right, well here. Right. So from the government guy, um, Tim banged it right on the head. You know, government needs to be able to use its procurement power to create those spaces for these opportunities for the Microsofts of the world, for um, the advocates of the world to really create uh, inclusive. Um, I, ICT to have access to internet. In Canada, uh, just this past July, the Accessible Canada Act was uh, come, came into force. And that act is meant to create a culture change within government, and by extension, the rest of Canadian society. It'll impact government departments as well as federally regulated uh, entities. And it speaks towards the things that Tim had raised about uh, procurement, about hiring practices, uh, about creating safe spaces, um, and that ensuring that the barriers that are currently existing within federal government, within how we do our business, are eliminated, and that we use our procurement power and just our just pure size to be able to influence society as a whole. So um, just from a Canadian government perspective, hopefully in the next 10 years we'll uh, be able to come back to this table and say that we've moved the bar that much further, that um, the presentations we make are that much more accessible. Yeah. Oh look, she's got something to say. <laughs> And it might be a little bit. Ah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, acceleration. I, I, I worry when you have all of that sort of like that list of the great and the good that things will take long to move on. And I don't know whether we have lots of time. I don't think we've got 10 years. <laughs> Go on. Well, I, I would argue the issue has been long-standing yes. and I think um, to have meaningful change you need to have a culture change and that culture change doesn't occur like within a day Correct. it doesn't come within a year yeah. it really is um, reinforcing um, the positive ideas of inclusion of having mm -hmm. a blended workforce mm -hmm. of keeping accessibility top of mind mm -hmm. uh, and it's um, something I don't think that we'll be able to change in um, a year from now, sure. not in a meaningful way. On the surface, obviously, we mm. able to do many things, mm. but mm. Uh, to have that meaningful change where after we've retired and passed on that 
the good works will just continue. Yeah, I hear that. And, and, and I suppose I'm not, I'm obviously I'm not saying that for a year, and obviously I, I'm aware of the culture change. I mean, I began this conversation saying that, you know, I'm part of a company that, if you haven't noticed already, has gone through a massive culture change. And I know in terms of the way that we've been sort of like laser focused on doing stuff that's smart, that's quick, that's impactful. And I feel that if we can, if you and I can meet in the middle, right, and just say, actually, in some respects, don't reinvent the wheel. Come speak to us, go speak to Satcha. Mm -hmm. How can you cut and paste what I've literally said now, and only, you know, I've only touched on a minor bit of what we can do, cut and paste it into one government organization. And probably, we could probably have that conversation, have that rolled out in 12 months, 18 months, and, and vice versa. So I suppose I'm kind of being a little bit, um, I'm pushing. I, I, I feel we need to push, um, especially if we start, want to start, Brian, to your point, start talking about these organizations and treaties and what have you, because we all know how long a treaty will take. We all know, I work in the regulatory space as well, we all know how long that can take. I feel that there's some cost-effective, quick, already done solutions that we can maybe, low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. that, we can, or that we can do. So maybe, if it is a fora, a fora to identify low-hanging, really quick stuff, so we can do this thing and get going. Yeah. <laughs> That's provoked me to be naughty again. But, but you know, you're never going to reduce inequality if you only pick the low-hanging fruit. You've actually got to start at the most difficult, the most marginalised. You know, women in patriarchal societies with disabilities. Let's start there. And, and, and we can do it. It's easy to do if we have the will to do it. So I just had to pick you up on that. No, 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 no. no. Everyone has to show success. You do a pilot, you pick the low-hanging fruit, you show it works, and then try and flog it to the government or donors. That leads to greater inequality. So unless you work with the first billion, not the next billion, not the bottom billion, the first billion, because they're the most important, those at what others call the bottom. We don't work there. We're not we're not going to <laughs> apologies. We're not going right, that was just telling me to shut up. <laughs> Yeah, um, so three things. Um, so I think first, and again from the global perspective, is again uh, uh, research, um, still to understand uh, the, 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 the cultural and social factors that may impact the issue of accessibility. The second thing is um, data, so on persons with disabilities. And again, we spoke about uh, this earlier. So um, it's really important to, uh, when we think about consultation, participation on different types of disabilities. And we don't really have this full picture in the global south because we don't have disaggregated data. Um, and the third thing will be also, um, I mean, uh, in a context where we have limited resources, it's really important for us to think how, how best do we use those limited resources. So things, uh, things um, uh, around coordination of different sectors involved um, uh, it's very important. Uh, 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 some of our countries are not autosufficient. We are not able to finance our own budget 100%. So it's very important to think about how do we use the, f the few resources we have. And also, I mean, uh, Tim spoke about, I mean, the great work the FED is doing. So it's important also for us to think what's the role of these big international agencies in the global south and how. Uh, can we uh, work with them to impact the policies uh, that they implement in the global south? Absolutely. All right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, uh, they waved at us back there. I know we've run a bit over, but we truly appreciate the engagement here. Great engagement uh, in this session and, and lots to think about. Um, please be on the lookout for the follow-up. Uh, oh, I'm, I apologize. Are you, are you Sorry. Are you closing up? I, I think, yeah, You're I think we have up. to, uh, yeah. Did you want to oh. Please, no, please, <laughs> yeah. please speak. Sorry. So, thank you. Um, my name is Judy. I come from Kenya. Um, thank you for the discussions. Um, um, just like Manik had, had said, uh, when you come, it comes to the global south, then um, it turns around. 
Um, one of the things that I was even discussing with uh, Gunella is the use even of the term of accessibility. All right. So when you come to Kenya to talk about accessibility, they will tell you, oh, we are going to set up infrastructure there and they are going to have internet. All right. So you need to be very particular when you're saying accessibility for persons with disability. Um, it's, it's interesting to hear from the government guy. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Yes, it's interesting to hear that um, uh, the government in Canada is actually listening um, to the people and um, what is it that the persons with disability need and require. Um, an example, like uh, right now in Kenya, um, the government services are going online, which is totally great. So we have this platform we call the eCitizen platform. And unfortunately, the eCitizen platform uh, there is no screen reader that can read it, all right? So you find that um, if you need to um, uh, renew your license, then you have to go online. Uh, but if you have a visual, uh, I'm supposed to finish. All right. <laughs> that if somebody has a, uh, has a visual disability, then you still need to get somebody else to, to help you to do that. If you need to get a passport, then the same. So when you talk about uh, the power of procurement, what happens in, a, in an instance whereby the government itself is not following on, on the rules that it has set up? I mean, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm, Government Canada has been listening to um, its sort of uh, citizens, but you know this is this is the first year that that act came into to effect. Uh, in the past, we we've had similar issues where we've created online portals, and it really is um, using the voice of this forum and um, grassroots organizations to sort of help uh, shift that change. Um, that's how the Accessible Canada Act came about. Uh, there was a groundswell from the disability community from all corners uh, demanding that the government do better, uh, that it support all of its citizens, and so that's the result of the Accessible Canada Act. And so I would say take heart. Like this is just, it's a process, and um, I know it can be tiring, but the, the outcome will be amazing. Wish we had more time, folks. Uh, I know that we have run over. Apologies to IGF staff there. Thank you all so much. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists and everything. Thanks a lot. Look for the follow-up report. Thanks, all. <laughs>